This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer for the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia. In doing so, I take this opportunity to acknowledge that the University of South Australia is on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. And we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. So I'm a tad super excited. This is our first event for the year. So it's great to be back running events again at the Hawke Centre. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Now, we're going to be discovering the fascinating world of whales with acclaimed wildlife scientist, Dr. Vanessa Perotta, as she discusses her book, Humpback Highway, Diving into the Mysterious, Mysterious World of Whales. So a very warm welcome, extremely warm welcome to you, Vanessa, and thank you for joining us in Adelaide. We're pleased to be presenting tonight's event in partnership with WAM Adelaide's Planet Talks, and I would like to acknowledge Planet Talks producer, Rob Law, thank you. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the publisher, New South Books, and for supporting and continuing to support great writers and thinkers. Dr. Vanessa Perotta is a wildlife scientist and science communicator. Her research uses innovative technologies for wildlife conservation. She is a passionate science communicator who loves making science accessible to all. Her work as an early career researcher and advocate for STEM in schools has been recognised by the Australian Financial Review as one of the top 100 women of influence and has seen her listed as one of science and technology superstars of STEM. Tonight, we'll, Vanessa will be in conversation with another superstar, Professor Chris Daniels. Chris is currently the presiding member and chair of the Green Adelaide Landscape Board and chair of the Koala Life Foundation. He's an adjunct professor of biology and clinical and health sciences at the University of South Australia and is focused on conserving wildlife and connecting people with nature. Please join me a very warm welcome to Dr. Vanessa Perotta and Professor Chris Daniels. Thank you. Welcome everyone to what will be an absolutely fantastic hour of discussion about whales. And whales are truly a group that is the most wonderful and the fascinating of the world's beasts. Whales dominate the marine ecosystems in so many ways, some obvious and some obscure. Whales have also interacted with human culture and civilizations across the world for tens of thousands of years, supporting human growth and changes, sometimes to their own detriment. And it's not just scientists that are fascinated by whales. Whales attract incredible interest from avid David Attenborough series watchers to tourists and adventurers wanting to spend time and experience personally the world's largest animals. I consider myself very lucky to have spent time on several field trips and holidays with whales around the world, observing them up close in extraordinary environments like Peninsula Valdez, which we'll touch on this afternoon, um, in Argentina, um, the Kimberley Coast, and exploring Canada, catching up with belugas, fin whales, humpbacks, orcas, dolphins, and porpoises, and I've listed all of those to make Vanessa very jealous indeed. That's true. Um, this was one of the, my greatest of wildlife thrills. However, visiting whale destinations also opens other windows into the deep past. And that really is understanding the deep and multi-layered connections between whales and First Nations people. Whale-based tourism is both a central theme to Indigenous culture and is now a very important component for local economies, for First Nations people and small regional communities around the world. However, ecotourism does create a challenge. Uh, how can humans connect with whales without crowding them or interfering with their daily activities? 
And it is not just ecotourism that threatens the ecology of Wales. Shipping, pollution, residual effects of over-harvesting, climate change, food availability, and other human-induced activities all threaten the survivability of Wales. So tonight, we're going to take a deep dive. That's a pun. <laughs> Wait for laughter to finish, excellent. A deep dive into the world of Wales, their connection with human cultures spanning 65,000 years, and the threats that they are exposed to today. And we are going to view Wales through the eyes and lived experience of Dr. Ver Vanessa Perotta. Dr. Perotta is one of Australia's most important and emerging marine scientists and author of Humpback Highway, Diving into the Mysterious World of Wales. Seen here? It is compulsory that you all purchase a copy of the book <laughs> as you go out. So we're going to get a chance to understand what makes a zoologist tick as well and to understand how a passion for one of the most elusive and difficult to study animals can take a country girl and a mother of two to become one of Australia's Financial Review's top 100 women of influence. And she has gone on to host the Prime Minister's Prize for Science and then her most difficult task at all, doing play school. That's right. right. <laughs> so we've got a, a lot of ground to cover. So Vanessa, look, let's, let's start off with whales. Let's, let's go right back to the beginning and tell us about the two types of whale. Well, thank you for the introduction. You're too kind. So there are, and hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy that this room is full and thank you for those online and the person or people in Scotland. Hello. Okay, so let's start with what are the types of whales? So you have two whales. This is whale 101. Ready? We're going in, we're diving in. Go diving in. Many puns as we can get in tonight, okay? So you have your high frequency communicators, you, so your toothed whales. And then you have your toothless whales. Let's go over to the toothed whale world, okay? We're talking high frequency sounds, sounds with the teeth, no, not really. But they're your dolphins and your sperm whales. These are the toothed whales. A dolphin, a sperm whale, they can produce high frequency sounds. Dolphins, if you've ever heard them, sound like, not like, well, kind of they do sometimes. They sound like this. You can hear them talking when you're on the way they're bow riding. It's the coolest thing and I lose my mind over it. And sperm whales, they can sound like this. Because they're putting out sound to see if you blank out your eyes right now and you're down 3,000 feet, 3,000 meters below the water trying to find a giant squid and you're the giant squid and I'm going to eat you. So it's using sound <laughs> to see the world. Did I go too far already? It's early. It is early. And, and well, so we're, that's our toothed whales. And so toothed whales, sperm whales, dolphins, and dolphins, they can produce sound using, using these phonic lips, the monkey, I won't go into the science of it, but um, by alternating the pitch that comes out of their blowhole. And I used to be a dolphin trainer, and you can train the animals to produce samples for the science world to do something known as a chuff, and you can go, and the animal can go, um, I haven't made whale sounds yet, so don't worry. Oh, I've just done the sperm whales. So that's our toothed animals, toothed whales. Toothed whales, yeah. Okay, let's go over to, let's dive into the other way, which is the toothless, which is your humpback whales. This is the animal you're all going to learn about tonight. Toothless whales have hair-like strands. If you're feeling your hair right now, your fingernails, that's the same component of what is inside a humpback whale's mouth. Toothless whales have baleen plates, long hair-like strands that hang from the roof of their mouth. Has everyone seen Finding Nemo? Some people have. If you haven't, you have got to see it this weekend. So Finding Nemo, they go in the mouth, okay? They're hanging out in the tongue. You'll see this, if you see it, it looks like a broom around them. That's the baleen plates that's designed to, when these animals feed, they will feed on krill or small fish and they'll open their mouth up, expand their throat like an accordion or a slinky, and they'll engulf their food and then they'll come, shut their mouths, then they'll expel that water on the side and their prey is caught on the baleen and uh, then they swallow it. So that's toothed whales are here, high frequency. And then your toothless baleen whales, they're the ones that produce low frequency sounds which are designed to travel over long distances. 
short distance high frequency with our toothed whales and the low frequency sounds, which is the humpback whales, which yes, career highlight play school, I made whale sounds. Whoop, 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 and then the and it's all on play school. It was the best thing of my life. So <laughs> yes, but it's how people learn. And we've already pinpointed George at the front. Sorry, George, to pick on you. He's the same age as my nephew. He's also called George. So, you know, we've got to really tailor how we talk to everyone here. And that's one of the things I love doing as a scientist. Fantastic. We've covered a lot of ground early on, but I think because we brought George into the conversation, Sorry, we have to go to the single most important biological characteristic of oh. whales, oh. which is their poo. Uh. Now, Vanessa has done quite a deal of work and understanding of the role of whale poo in ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And I, I have seen whales poo, and it's not very nice. Well, it's a bit fluffy, isn't it? It's, it's a bit pinky orangey, and there's so much of it. So what <laughs> we when, when we come to think about whales in terms of how they control their ecosystem, mm. who's an important part? Well, there might be some people here that, you know, think, oh, whales, again, whales, I'm dragged along here. Whales are so cool. I'm sick of them being cool. But actually, whales are important to every single person here and on Earth. So it's kind of like an astronomy thing, Paul. We've got astronomers in the audience. Um, and so the reason being is one of the things that makes whales so important is their poo. They are giant fertilizers of the ocean. And I'll tell you why. The humpback whale is a great example. They'll feed in one area, and humpback whales don't necessarily dive down to 1,000 meters. Maybe they're around 200 meters or even at the surface, depending on where their food is. They'll eat that, and then a bit of time will happen, and then it's, oh, time to go. They don't have coffee. Um, apparently, you drink coffee, that happens. I don't drink coffee. Uh, uh, this is for another topic. Um, but the whale world is, something happens. Yeah. They, they, they come to the surface. <sighs> And then when they're at a different place where they've eaten, so they might have eaten over here, they come up to here, take a breath, and they go, oh, I've got to go. And out they go. It doesn't come out like that. <laughs> it's a bit different. It kind of comes out in like a stream of juiciness, of good nutrients. You enjoying this, George? Yeah. <laughs> you really, you need that for the ocean because the animals that they eat are small krill, which are kind of like this big Antarctica krill. I was just in, I was over Antarctica with an audience member, Patrick, in the audience, wherever you are, Patrick. We were flying over Antarctica not too long ago and they were down in Antarctica, which they are right now, feeding on krill, Antarctic krill. And so they're pooing down there there and that poo helps drive our climate because it's feeding the smallest creatures which help provide the food that you and I eat whether you be vegetarian or not or you don't you're all, you don't eat seafood whatever it is it, it, it is very important for the functioning of a healthy marine ecosystem and this is why we need whales it, it is it's a really important area that isn't known, isn't it? So we tend to think about what goes into them, mm. the, the krill, the fish, the yeah. salmon, yep. but it's actually what comes out that provides the nutrients in the system. So whales do a whole lot of other really interesting behavioural things, not just um, and produce huge amounts of, of red ick. <laughs> um, and I'm going to throw some words at you. Oh, okay. Can you tell me what these behaviours are? Spy hopping. Ah, yes, the good old spy hop. A spy hop is when a humpback whale or another whale um, can come up. So this is the whale mouth. I should have brought Winston, my toy whale. Anyway, they come up to the surface of the water and they literally will bring their eye out. And if they're looking at you in the boat, they will look at you. Or if you're in the water, their eye is the size of a rock melon. Uh, if you're American, cantaloupe, is that what it is? Yeah, or a baseball. You can hold the eyeball in your hand. This is a big eye. Like, that is a massive eye. And just for scale, when I like to give talks like this, I like to tell people just how big a whale is. We need to just, and get me, help me get back on track in a moment. If you can think about sitting in a bus or your car that you got here in, um, that is not as wide as a whale can get. So if, if the audience members are here, there's like four seats. That's typically, that's a nice width of a humpback whale. So that's, I'm talking four seats. So between you and me here, that's a humpback whale. And the length of this stage, oh, that's a calf. That's a baby whale. So they're really big animals. And so their eyeballs, when they come out and they look at you, it's, it's impressive. And that's a spy hop. Sorry to go on the tangent. Fantastic. 
mugging. Ah, no loss of money. What happens is the whales might come around the boat and they'll look at you and they'll just be the most, oh my gosh, this is amazing. A few years ago, I did Southern Ocean Live where we were collecting whale snot. That's right, we'll get to that. And Sadly, we will. Yes, I'm just not joking. And the whales came around the boat. We actually had, we were looking at these two whales and the whales were doing their thing and then we actually, at one of the propellers of the, sh the boat I was on caught some line because people, they leave rubbish in the ocean, it's bad for us as well. And we thought, uh oh, there goes our whale, see you later. And then all of a sudden, these two whales were like, where did that sound go? Maybe, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to anthropomorphize or put a human thought on it. But the animals came to our boat and started circling the boat. This is all online. Um, I have this clip to the point where I was crying because I was just like, this is unbelievably amazing. These whales just, just looking at us. And, and then the moment where two school buses come under and I, and I was going to the crew, oh my gosh, they're here, they're here. And I will lose my mind. I don't care if I've seen 10 billion whales, I will still lose my mind. They're incredible, and most of the year you don't get to see them because they're in Antarctica feeding, but now they're wrapping up their feeding, they've put on a lot of weight, it's time for them to head north to the whale disco to breed. All right, we'll get on to that too. Mm -hmm. Logging. Oh, logging. It's a great one. It's where the whales just sit there at the, at the surface of the, of the water and just hang out. I've seen whales in Antarctica. The water is as calm as anything with icebergs behind them just with their pectoral flippers just hanging, just acting like a log. That's a really good one. And seals love doing that too. Like on land though, they can haul out. Bubble net feeding. Oh yes, bubble net feeding. Not all humpback whales do this. So only some humpback whales know how to do this. And that's really important in the science world because how do they learn? Is it Jack and Jill who teaches them from millennia away? Is it George's grandparents that have taught George to bubble net feed and then has, has enabled him to learn how to do it? So it's essentially these animals will do it independently or with a, a mate, they'll deliberately blow bubbles in a net, and it makes a bubble net around their food, and all the fish are like, oh, there's bubbles everywhere, everyone, just pack in, pack in. And then the whales know, yep, this is it. I'm gonna now come underneath, and I'm going to open my mouth wide because everything is in a nice, a nice package for me to invest my energy to then gulp up the food. And then sometimes, in, you've seen this, yeah. I've seen this in Australia and, and um, Antarctica, and then they come up and then they engulf their food. Yeah. In fact, when I didn't know about whales when I was a little girl, that's the photos I saw where I didn't understand what part of the body it was. So there you go, it's the mouth that comes up. Uh, breaching. That's a fun one, where the whales deliberately come out of the water and splash, making a lot of sound. So you can see that with um, Southern Rights here. Oh. Anyone in the audience seen those at the Nullarbor? It's pretty spectacular. Yeah, it's a... Southern Right Whales are beautiful too. And they will do that for fun? Well, that's the million dollar question. Is it for fun? Is it a way of generating a lot of noise if your mate Fred is over there or if you want to let Jessica know that you're in the distance. I'm just gonna make a splash here and hello everyone. Because sometimes it might be too noisy because there's too much shipping noise or underwater construction or it could be really windy. And when it's windy and noisy and rainy, it's hard to talk to each other over a long distance. So I'm gonna go, mm, whoop, cut my talking and I'm gonna go splashing and make a lot of noise. So two more quick bits of general well, um, biology. You talked about the sound and how they made it, the types of sound. Why do baleen whales make the song? Well, we believe in the humpback whale world that it is the males that sing. There's a fun fact. The male humpback whales are the only one that sings. Females and young ones can produce moans and groans or whisper because there's some research that's come out that show by whispering, we're not going to let Romeo over there know that I'm a really good looking mum with a baby and, and the killer whales, we won't let them know. So that's why I'm gonna whisper. Some great research in Madagascar came out to show that, that it's actually advantageous if you're a mum to whisper, to not let the other males know that you're there because you know what? Some humpback whale mums, they have a young calf, they've just fed and then they've fasted and they'll continue to fast and they give birth, then they feed their calf about 100 litres of milk a day. I don't know that fact, but it's around that. 
Then they've got a calf to look after. They have to check out for human impacts. Um, at the same time, they need to make sure that they're okay without having food for a long time. And then they've got to look out for killer whales, then they've got to look out for males, and then they've got to migrate all the way back to Antarctica. That is a lot as a mum. So respect to humpback whale mums. And so they have adapted how they will talk. But the males, we think it's most likely a result of producing sound to attract others or to communicate to other males that I am the sexiest male here, listen to me sing. And some males, for research from Queensland University has shown that some males have gone, no, that's out now. The coolest thing to do is to be quiet and then go see some females or be quiet and just get into a bit of a rough and tumble with other males and then have access to a lady. It's a bit of the, the, the sneaky lover syndrome mm. where you've got the, the big boys are out there posing and muscling and the little guy comes in and goes, oh, just, no one notices me. I can, I can be the, I'm a lover, not a singer. <laughs> yeah. so, it's, so it's really interesting, the different strategies. So that then brings us on to the last question, and of course the name of your book, the, oh. the highway, the super highway. So mm -hmm. whales migrate, huge distances, and yes. lots of the audience here know the southern right migrations. Why do they do it? How do they know where to go? Oh. I mean, do they always remember to turn left at Albuquerque? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Um, and why is it a highway? Okay, so it's referred to as a highway because we see a lot of animals transiting along a migratory corridor. So it's typically the east coast that we call the humpback highway. But if we think about on the west coast, which is a different humpback whale population, that's kind of like a humpback highway as well. Also, for blue whales, or pygmy blue whales, but that's not my area of expertise. And it's blubber to blubber during certain periods of time. And very exciting to announce to all of you here and online that one of my mates, Lee Mansfield, has seen, thank you, Lee, you're watching, has seen humpback whale today. That's right. So humpback whales are in Australian waters right now, which is exciting. So they're coming and they come to Australian waters, the humpback whales and the southern right whales, to reproduce. The reason they come to warmer waters is to give their calves the best chance of life. If they were born in Antarctica, ooh, they don't have much, they don't have any, well, they have blubber, but they don't have those reserves that one would need to really stand equipped for surviving the cold water. And gosh, that water's cold, I've swam in it. And so to come up here, they're born in beautiful areas where it's nice in the Kimberley on the west coast and the east, the Great Barrier Reef, or new research that we're working out or looking at right now is suggesting that perhaps climate change might be seeing the animals calving prior to our traditional breeding ground. So watch this space for some research. But they actually carve here, but they, they actually mate in Antarctica. Well, no, up here in Australian waters, they're typically here to breed and calve. So right. adjust the gestation period or how long a whale mum is pregnant for is around 11 to 12 months. So if she fell pregnant last year, she'll be coming up to give birth or give birth along the way. And if she had a baby last year, the calf is only with her for about a year in which they become a yearling. And then it's, see you later. No, none of this 18 year old sticking around in the humpback whale world. And then it's off to going and doing your thing and potentially having another baby. So a humpback whale can have a calf every two to three years, in some cases every year. Whereas the southern right whale, and this is a biggie, doesn't have such a quick turnaround. It's more like three to five years. That's why the southern right whale numbers are not doing as well. We also have a number of pressures and, and threats that we as humans face for not just southern right whales but all whales and I do talk about that in the book but the humpback highway is referring to that blubber to blubber annual migration so that's why when I as a scientist I wanted to produce content for both small kids and big kids like yourselves to have as an annual resource to go well, why are all the whales here and so that's why that's why essentially I've written the first book the voyage of whale and calf to document that for the small kids, which is secretly for the big kids. Because as a parent, I read books to my kids and I learn along the way. I mean, why wouldn't you? And then I, div I, I really wanted to write this book because, well, everyone needs a scientist to break down information to them in a fun and accessible way. And it's not dry. Because I, if a book is really long and dry, I put it down and I'm, um, I have two small calves. I don't have time to read that much. So I want something where I can just chunk read. But it's safe to say this, this book is not dry and it covers some topics 
that once you start them, there, there are images that I cannot unsee, um, and sadly. Yes. And one bit, of course, relates to the, the male member for the ah, yes. whales, and we, we men will salute the whales, I think, right now. Um, you describe in detail both the activity of said member, ah, yes. um, as well as its length and girth. Look at Paul, he's already... Don't started. worry, everyone, kids, this is fine. This is all absolutely appropriate. Biology. So, in the whale world, how does one reproduce? One needs to come... A, a, one needs to sort out their, their tools and make sure they can swim appropriately, have hydrodynamics, and also invest in the next generation if you get what I'm trying to say here appropriately. So the Southern Right Whale really is the star of the world. Uh, we're, because we're South a, Australian. South Australian. Yeah. So Southern Right Whale males have extremely large male parts, and I'm talking about their testicles. This is, don't worry, this is explained to a small age, so this, everything's appropriate what I'm about to speak about. And so the reason that they have a 500 kilogram testicles, so that's one ton testicles, that's right. See, big kids love this. Is because their, their strategy, and we believe this as scientists, is they, in order to reproduce the next generation, they will come together in certain areas where there's multiple males. So it may be advantageous for the males to produce a lot of sperm. So when he does mate with a female, he uses part of that sperm to flush out the previous generation of another male who may have had access to a female. And then he's then able to secure genetically He's long lines, if you know what I mean. So th that's an evolutionary amazing thing. And if we're talking about the actual length of certain things, um, that can be up to three meters long. So, and it needs to be like that because it needs to be able to travel to a certain place, like aeroplane refueling, kind of. <laughs> I'm an aviation nerd. I love aeroplanes, by the way, if there's any nautical people in here. So that's the way I, I yeah. So it, it needs kind of twirl here and there, but then it all comes back in and it's all nicely packaged. And females, their anatomy is just everything's so streamlined. They will have their female area and then on the side they'll have their two mammary slits where the little calves will come up and drink and then behind that there's the, the poo shoot, you could say. But it's, that's not scientifically correct, that terminology. But learning about the biology of how does a mammal go about doing what they do is so quirky because they are mammals like you and I. Let's just remember this. They're breathing air like all of us in this room are doing and online. If you don't breathe, you don't live. Humpback whales need to actively think about breathing and coming to the surface. If they don't, they're gone. We are automatic breathers. You are breathing right now, although you're all thinking about it, aren't you now? <laughs> uh, but you weren't before. We just do it because that's how our biology is set up. And another fun fact about whales, they don't breathe through their mouth because they can't. So if you've seen my TEDx talk, I'm going to spoil it for you, but Marlon and Dory, Nemo's dad, you know how they go through the mouth and then miraculously they pop out of the blowhole? Mm -mm -mm. There's only one way out and it's not pretty. Okay? Anatomically incorrect. And of course, the, the, the male member is probably the origin of a lot of the sailors' uh, yes. sea serpents. Yep. Because they'd see things coming out of the water that you really shouldn't be seeing? Like um, lo the Loch Ness Monster. So it, it, is, it is, although you might find it very bizarre, it's a very interesting part of the whale world and how do we get whales from the next generation? So th these are all the questions we've asked. And David Attenborough, as I talk about in the book, he described it so well. It's just such an amazing thing to see. So yes, we love David Attenborough. So you've got to collect all of this information mm. about whales and we've got, I think we have here about 35 species of, of cetacean. There's a lot to do and a lot to collect, but it involves being able to identify individuals. Yes. Otherwise you're not going to be able to really identify the individualistic nature of much of this behaviour. So working out which one is which is really a challenge. You can get dead ones and then weigh their bits as you've described yes. in quite spectacular detail, really. Um, or you can look at tail flukes. Yes, the underneath of a tail. Mm -hmm. But you actually developed your own methodology for identifying individual whales. More accurate, so well, it's, it's some, very involved the snot. <laughs> You've got to get onto the snot. So, so one of the ways that we researched, so one of the during my PhD at Macquarie University, one of the ways that we were trying to access whales, we wanted to do it in ways that didn't hurt whales. We don't have to kill whales to learn about them. 
That's, that's a really good thing. There is, I, I love the sweep of generations in this room right now because many of you would have seen that there was, the Humpback Highway was probably empty. In fact, my supervisor, Professor Rob Harcourt, remembers that there was hardly any whales off Sydney back in the 60s, 70s, and there really wasn't. I mean, that, for me, that's like, that's crazy. Um, and so we wanted to find out how can we access these animals without having to hurt them. And the use of drones was something during my PhD that I was like, this, this is so cool, this is so such a great tool. I don't know anything about drones, but I love whales. How can we merge the two? And I was on the boat one day with Dean Crop, his mate, and um, he also had some aerial cinematographers, Heli Guy Scientific, which was on there with my mate Alastair Smith. And they're drone experts. They fly for like Thor, uh, anything, any cool car red you see, you know, these guys do it. And so we merged our brains together and thought, well, what could we collect? And as the whales are in the distance, I was, we were thinking, oh, hold on a sec, they produce a lot of that. Because I thought about whale poo for one moment, but they don't, they're not eating off Sydney necessarily. So there's, they need to be somewhere where they've eaten. So off Sydney, they're, they're really on their way to that disco. So collecting whale lung microbiota, also known as whale snot, was the ultimate in the use of a drone. But back then, drones were like, and they still are, $10,000 and they weren't accessible. So we decided to build our own. Why not build our own? Let's try, I'll pretend to be the whale with the hose. Let's work out where to put the Petri dish. And it's like the ultimate PCR sample because back then there wasn't COVID. So I couldn't say we're using PCR to collect whale snot and you would be like, oh yes, I've had my nose swabbed. So I, don't, I didn't have that luxury. So we refer to it as whale snot because it essentially is the lung bacteria coming from their lungs that comes up. And we collect that with a drone by swooping in as the drone sees the whale. Alistair Smith is flying because this is a drone operated in manual mode. I can't fly these drones. And we're on a, we're on a boat. And uh, Alistair and I get seasick. So I get seasick. Yeah, that's right. There's no shame in having a quick vomit and driving a boat. <laughs> so... Yeah, that all happens at once. The dr whale's there, and then I spot the whale, and, and then Alistair flies a drone out, sees the whale. Ah, oh, there it is. And then Alistair's like, I can't see the whale from the drone. And I go, yes. And then as the whale comes up, pfft, I actually document this in the book. The first time we collected whale snot was off Bondi Beach. So it was probably a gorgeous day. There was probably German backpackers on the beach, not knowing what snot collecting was happening in the back there. And then we collected the snot from this one whale that was brilliant. And I say that because the whale just went, pfft, down, 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 seven minutes, I'm gonna pop back up. And I was able to track this whale and this whale was so good. I thanked this whale. And then when we collected our first sample, I just went, I hugged Alistair and I remembered he's still flying and I was like, uh oh. <laughs> and then he's like, he was still flying, so the drone was still in the air. We, we, the sample hadn't even made it back to the boat. But it was like we could do this and we ended up being the world first to be able to develop the drones we have, but also the use of the flip lid Petri dish, which meant that we could collect the sample snap it shut and not have an open petri dish where we'd be sampling the air. So we wanted to snap it shut and then go back to the laboratory before we opened it and worked out the goobies inside. And um, we were also the first in the world to collect viruses from whales via this method and the first in the world to collect dolphin snot from a drone. So and, uh, my PhD was such a great platform to go on and that's why I now do as, as a scientist merging technology for wildlife conservation. And that's why I've been drawn on other projects like looking at detecting illegal wildlife trafficking with Taronga Zoo and rapid scan systems and also the Australian federal government, which is using AI to look for lizards and things in your luggage. So as a scientist, you can work on one thing and then some people go, oh, we might use your skill set over here, come over here as well, and that kind of thing. So that's all in the book. It's a fantastic piece of technology. The, it is incredibly important because whales often suffer from pneumonia, all sorts of respiratory diseases, so being able to know what might be knocking them off. Yeah, and, and also changes in the population. Uh, there might be something yeah. related to health, and we can couple this with drones measuring whales from the Ooh, air. So you can work out how long a whale is from a drone just by flying it over. I mean, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to fly, that's 16 metres. There's a lot of not unfun stuff behind the scenes to process the data, but I'm just telling you this to make, be realistic as a scientist. We don't just go flap around with whales. We do, we do the hard stuff as well, uh, but it is such a, and I love this because it's such a great example for young kids and, and those people who might want a career change to go, wow, STEM is so exciting. And, and STEAM, have you heard of STEAM? Science, technology, engineering, arts, 
and math, I'm a big pro STEAM person because the drone is such a visual journey and we need people with great visual minds in the science world because us as scientists, we're dorky and we need things to look good, just like the front cover of my book, that kind of thing. So it's all about collaboration. So look, I think we might pause Wales for a moment and take a deep breath. Um, I hope you're noting, noting down all of these, these uh, various terminologies that we've been doing. Um, and switch gears to talk a little bit about you. So um, this book is a lot about your personal journey and how you got into Wales as a country girl coming to the, to the, the big oceans. And in particular, I'd like to start with how Migaloo shaped your initial views of oh. becoming involved with Wales. Well, I didn't even know Migaloo was Migaloo. Migaloo is the famous white humpback whale. You all know about Migaloo? He, he's, Albino? Yeah. So Migaloo is a, was first seen in 1991. Fortunately, my first chapter of my book explains this. So I'll just give away a few of the secrets. I'm not good at selling my book, am I? Uh, but anyway, so Migaloo was first seen in 1991 where they saw this white whale off Byron Bay and they're like, wow, this whale's white. Uh, what's going on here? And then long story short, they were able to sample and, def and determine that it was a male and it's most likely a result of an albinism. In fact, we wrote a paper about it not too long ago and now people are sending me their white whale photos because there are other whales in the world that are white and we're trying to work out if they're either just dead or in fact they are white. And so there's a mixture of things. And so the search for Migaloo continues. So uh, yeah, so Migaloo actually came into my life a little later. Um, going back to your question, I grew up in a, on a farm outside of Canberra. Is any any Canberrans here? Yes, yes, we love the Canberrans. So I grew up on a farm, uh, Murren Bateman, I had 40 acres. And so for me, whale books were my closest thing to seeing whales and then the movie Free Willy was the best thing in the world. I begged my mum to buy that video. Yes, video, George, I'm old. <laughs> video. It's like this thing was like this. <laughs> yeah, that's not right to explain it. But yeah, it was a video and I watched it on repeat and I always wanted to be a dolphin trainer. And so I actually did become a dolphin trainer. I worked in a zoo with giraffes and things like that in Canberra, National Zoo, in aquarium while I studied at NU. And then I was able to become a dolphin trainer. And then unfortunately my mum passed away that year, which made me go, oh, I need to reassess a few things. And then it led me down the path of, I have no idea what I was going to do. I never thought I would become a scientist, honestly. It's just it's so much. It's really interesting. Actually, Pre Willy is a, a, a great story because it also changed the way the world thought yeah. about whales yep. um, and led to, of course, the release of, of Willy. What was his? Yeah, Keiko. Keiko, that's right. Which, that is actually yeah. really interesting yeah. because, from a conservation perspective, there was a lot of money put into one individual. Mm -hmm. And, like, I, I love the guy. He's passed away now, unfortunately. But there was a lot of conservation dollars for one individual yeah. that was then captured from the wild, taught to love humans, because I've been a dolphin trainer, I understand the processes, and then essentially gone, oh no, we're gonna take you from here. Now I don't really want you to like me. I'm gonna teach you how to try and find your own food. Like imagine this poor individual that can live up to 50 plus years. And then we're gonna go in the ocean now, I'm gonna put you here and I'm gonna change you here and then I'm gonna let you go and then go, go, go. I don't, really don't wanna see you because for your own good. And then this poor thing is traveling yeah. the world. This is my opinion, obviously. And then seeks out human attention because that's what it's been taught to love. That's it's like saying to your dog, Jack, don't come near me anymore because it's for your own good. So it's very tricky. And now we've since, like the, the world is, is moving away from captive environments. But I must point out here, Zoos and marine in institutes do play a very big conservation role. I obviously don't support the capturing of wild animals, but in some cases there are animals that are rescued, like I used to work with a bear, a sun bear in Canberra Zoo who was about to become bear poor soup. Oh. She now has a legacy as an ambassador animal and had a baby, Mary, who lives at Taronga Zoo, and she sat on my lap, she's very cute, this is at Canberra Zoo. So, and people can connect to that, and that's really important. So we have a responsibility of the animals that are in facilities to look after to them and to use them as ambassador animals, but also in some cases, the responsibility that we have, we have an opportunity to safeguard populations by through genetic gene banking and things like that. There's, it's a big topic. And the films like Free Willy does start to get the discussion going yeah. around the ethics. Um, it has changed the way we thought, because it's kind of the counterpoint, that story to Elsa, for example, where you had a happy ending for the lions, but it was far more complicated. 
And then, of course, there's movies like Whale Rider, which is one of my absolute <laughs> favourites. It is such a howl of the New Zealand movie. But you also use whales as a, and work by working with whales mm. connected with First Nations. Yes. And also with the fishing communities. Uh, and there are a lot of fantastic stories in your book. Yes. Yeah. So one of a great topic, because one of the things as a Canberran, I was wanting to do anything I could do to get close to the ocean. I didn't even know that there were two tides a day. Like, this is how remote I was. When I became a trainer, I was like, we have to wait for the tide. I'm like, what? I didn't even know that. And now I'm a marine biologist. Like, this is really bizarre for me. Uh, there's a high and a low tide and it happens twice a day. Hopefully that's right. Um, and so, yeah, um, sorry, I've gone on a tangent. Uh, but, so you, um, but first, the, the connection with First Nations. So I was- Trying to work out where on my question list I'm at. Uh, so. Sorry. So um, I would go down to Eden. Has anyone been to Eden? Yeah, Eden's gorgeous. There was a story of old Tom the killer whale with him and his pod would work with whalers and how I always was taught the story of the Davidsons, the European whalers, they were doing their thing, capturing whales, using these killer whales that would alert them that there's a whale in the area. These killer whales would let them know, come boys, whatever time of the day it was, there is a humpback whale here, we are gonna go get it together. And that's how I knew the story. But as I was doing, when I finished my PhD, I had an opportunity to work with some First Nation rangers uh, in Sydney called the Gamay Rangers. And my awareness of First Nations involvement with so many whale related things is just, I, I, I'm actually embarrassed I didn't do any of that in my PhD. It's ridiculous I didn't know about that. I, so this book was an opportunity for me to interview people who have direct lines, like uh, Warren, who I speak about, Warren Foster, who has his great, great, grandfather was a whaler. So this in, 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 sto in this story with the killers, killer whales of Eden, old Tom the killer whale, my book is a voice for the First Nations people to say, it was actually the First Nations people of that area who started that interaction and relationship with the killer whales through this. And it was just remarkable. And I was like, how did I not know that? It was lightly touched in documentaries. So don't, you know, it has been touched in documentaries, but it's really talking about how this connection started. How did the killer whales know that this was a benefit to them? How did the kill, why would the killer whale waste their resources and or was, it wasn't a waste? Why would a killer whale go, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to use my energy supply right now to go and tell you that there's a humpback whale here. Let's go. Unless it goes back thousands of years. So it was the, the First Nations people there. Yes. Somehow the other established that relationship. And we now know that orcas, you have territorial local mm -hmm. ones mm -hmm. versus the transients. Well, at the time of writing this book, oh gosh, every time I saw a new publication come out, I'd be sweating going, oh gosh, have I got that in the book? And uh, I was fortunately able to make corrections. But there was a research paper that came out that had taken some tooth... So it, old Tom's skeleton of the main head honcho of the Kilauea pod, his skeleton is in the Eden Museum. So there's this great method called ancient DNA sampling. So you can extract DNA from old Tom using gen, really old school method, well, new school methods, sorry, mm -hmm. because there's this thing called de-extinction where we're trying to bring back the woolly mammoth, the thylacine. And so what scientists have been able to do is to be able to take DNA that's ancient, old, and learn more about old Tom. And so they were able to drill into his tooth in the Kilauea Museum. And then Isabella Rees took this sample to Norway or overseas and was able to process this and worked out that old Tom, the population or the pod that was whaling, that would, would help out First Nations peoples and the European whalers, his population is, is now likely gone extinct. So those, those killer whales that used to do this is most likely gone extinct and their closest living relatives genetically are those in New Zealand across the Dutch. So how cool is that? Mm. So genetics, and they also had a great First Nations uh, incorporation in the paper with a local Thawa man, which were able to really reflect the First Nations involvement and also echo what I was saying in my book before it even came out in the publication. So it's all in the book. You've got the latest research in there, which is really exciting. And, and it really is fantastic, isn't it? To be able to track through yeah. First Nations connection with these animals yep. and then how that became incorporated into the way they whale. Yes. 150, <laughs> and the, even though the whole story wound up being mm. taken by the, the sort of the colonist view, the mm. story transcends. And of course, in your book, you also talk about Buri Buri. Yes, Buri Buri, which is the First Nations reference to humpback whale for the, the mobs of the clans of Sydney. So 
the First Nations people of Australia really are the first scientists, first whale scientists that goes back many, many years. And for them, they have a lot of these wonderful dreaming stories that I feature in this book, which talks about how Buriburi became, which is for some a totem or a spiritual ancestor. And so it was just, it's an incredible, it, it is a great reflection in here because a lot of it talks about the biology of how Buriburi came to be. And as a scientist, Learning about this is just, I sat down with some of the elders and I was so privileged because I just asked them all these great things and they, the way they tell their stories is so refreshing and it's just, wow, they're the science communicators that we as scientists should be listening to and that's why this is a great echoing of their story as well. Because as, as a scientist, merging Western science and First Nation science is so important, but it's also really colourful and cool. It's it's unbelievable the things that I've been able to learn and you should never stop learning and I actually don't know much about whales like honestly I don't and I've written a book about them there is so much more for us to learn They're such fantastic animals um, so that actually does bring us onto the challenges because the big risk is mm. they disappear before we know even enough about them let alone how to to bring them back or keep them around the place Whales have a lot of challenges, and yes. your book really goes into some of those in detail, and you've touched on it with the, the superhighway. But the one I wanted to start with is personal encounters. Oh, know? yes. So you're a, a great champion of experiential connections to, mm -hmm. to build those, as, as am I. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that people benefit enormously. And we've got uh, Daryl Jones here. We'll be talking about um, experiential connection with, with birds uh, at Woe Adelaide. There's a, a, a lot of debate out there in the community about connections with whales, yes. experiences. Should people swim with whales? Are they likely to be eaten Jonah <laughs> style? Yeah. Are we annoying whales to the point when orcas come up and chew the propellers off your boats as they did in Portugal? Or was that yeah, off the Iberian coast. So yeah. what, what is your feeling about experiential connections, whale watching, swimming with whales? Yes, yeah, so I was, as a young student, I went over to Tonga, to the Kingdom of Tonga, to assess the whale watching activities there. And I remember going, climbing up the hill, and it's all in the book, with my car battery to power my theodolite and laptop. A theodolite is that tripod thing that you use high school math. Sometimes on the side of the road you see someone, you think you're, you're getting booked, but it's not. Some, I see it and I'm like, oh, but now I know what it is. High school math, so you'll learn about this soon, George. Um, and so essentially, I was seeing, I remember seeing this whale and then I saw these two heads right next to the whale and I was like, oh my gosh, people are swimming with whales? Yeah. So this has been going on for many years. So I was assessing that, I was assessing compliance and then I also wanted to understand, well, what is it like? Because if I'm going to know about it, what, what happens with the, when you swim with a whale? And it is, there is a mixed, I have mixed feelings about it because you know, if in a, in a world we would not do anything near whales, we wouldn't operate, we wouldn't live or breathe or do anything. Um, and so it's, whale swimming in certain areas is, is quite topical. It's, there are rules and regulations in place to ensure that we minimise impacts and that's a good thing. But also we need to make sure that people or tourists understand it. And so I've had encounters with whales where there are whales there that see you and go, oh yeah, I'm just going to go for a sleep now. And then the calf comes up and does its thing and hangs out and then... And in Australian waters, it's, I must point out, you can't freely go and swim with the whale. Whales are protected in Australian waters. We also need to remember that whales are very large and don't often know their size. So we're tiny and movements from a whale can potentially hurt you. So just please bear that in mind. We also have national regulations and also state and territory. So I'm just putting that out there. Um, and so whale swimming is not gonna stop. Whale watching is not gonna stop. In fact, there is, and I talk about this in my book, this is a very challenging topic. Mm. People want to see whales, and I think they should be able to see whales. We need to learn more about how we can manage that in ways. You can whale watch from land, that's fine. Sometimes you'll be, there are people who go fishing who do not want to see a whale, and they see whales and they come to them. Oh. Uh, what do you do in that case? So there is a lot of research out there which looks at potential impacts of, of whale watching on a boat, whale swimming. There's a great paper look, talking about are we loving our whales to death? Uh, I would say that it's really important for people to learn about whales and to connect with them, but in ways that are appropriate, so making sure that they adhere to rules and regulations that are in place. 
uh, being mindful that if you're going to an area where you see a whale, just being respectful. And I think that if people can have that respect, then that's an amazing thing. But also whales are curious. There are some whales that want to see you and there are some whales that don't. Uh, and I talk about an experience that I had with a calf humpback whale that I had no idea what the experience would have ever in my life happened. And I, wanted, I don't know if I should tell the story. Well, keep that one as a special. Yeah. But it, but it is interesting, the experiential connection. Uh, mm. Jacques Cousteau famously said, you can't save what you don't love and you can't love what you don't know. Seeing from the boat, it, it is certainly an extraordinary experience. Yep. We were lucky to be at the peninsula of Aldex, yes. where there's the great um, mating gatherings there. We did that in 1991, of and the rules Southern were a right lot... Southern right whales. Southern right yes, whales. Yes, that's right. Yes, not humpbacks. But the rules were a bit laxer then, and you sort of look back and go, well, we probably did get a bit close. So the continual research about how close you can or should get, whether the whale comes to you or you mm. go to the whale, is a big difference. We, well, this is why I think it's evolving because we, as we continue, our boats get better, they get quieter. Even the shipping regulations, the International Maritime Organization is very mindful of the output of sound. So they're te teaching mariners to operate quieter and they're building ships that are quieter. That's, these are all positive steps. And as a scientist, I am so grateful to hear that. Um, uh, people have naturalists on boats that people, if they want to go to Antarctica, they can learn from someone who has experience and they connect with that. I was over Antarctica a few weekends ago at, as an Antarctic Science Foundation ambassador talking about the importance of research and why it's important to do that. For a lot of those people, they'll never be able to step on the ice and see Antarctica, but that might be their only chance to connect with the part of the world that is actually Earth's natural regulator of, of climate, that we unfortunately, because of climate change, warming of the, the Earth, we're reducing this sea ice, which means we reduce our ability to reflect heat out. So we're keeping it in here. If we lose sea ice, we lose krill. And if we lose krill, we lose basically the whole marine ecosystem and we lose our whales. So that's why it's all interconnected. I know it's a bit dry, but it's really important for you to know about. Like that's so important. So Antarctica is happening. People are in Antarctica right now and it is such an important part of the world for each and every one of us, whether you're streaming online right now or you're in this very room. Antarctica is a crucial part of the world and that's why if you see it even like you're seeing a whale, I am always grateful to see a whale, just to know that this animal can live up to 50, 80 years. Hopefully, I mean, what has that whale seen? Has it seen other whales that have been hunted? Uh, the longest living whale, it's in my book, I'm giving it away, anyway, is the bowhead whale, which lives in the Arctic, in the top of the world. And do you know why they worked out that it can be over, well, it can live over to 200 years, so that's the, over 150 to 200 years, but they actually found ancient harpoons embedded in its blubber. So they were able to date it back. So I talk about it in the book. So you've got long-lived animals, and are we going to talk about whale death? I know it's a bit morbid. We can talk about whatever you would like to talk about for this. But, you may as well bring it up now. But when a whale dies, so if a whale is long-lived, 80, 100 years, if we haven't entangled in fishing gear or struck it by a ship, being struck by a ship or released a balloon, don't you dare release your balloons into the air. I told all the play school kids that. Please don't do that. If a whale is able to live to a long age and they pass away due to natural causes, we're hoping it's natural causes, those animals over years acquire a lot of carbon in their body, right? And then when they die, some of them might float and then the white sharks will come and eat it. It's really cool. You want the white sharks or the tiger sharks to come and help the body break down because we need sharks in the ocean. They're awesome. I talk about white sharks in there too. Great white sharks. And they'll be breaking down the body and then eventually the body will fall to the bottom of the ocean. It's called a whale fall. And then when it's at the bottom of the ocean, it's got 40 tonnes worth of juicy blubber, which also has a lot of carbon in it. So those animals, when they die in death, they are acting in service to us. They're providing a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere, down to the bottom of the ocean. How incredible is that? See? Absolutely incredible. Did you know that? 
No, no. Oh, good, good, good. We've got a lot of facts tonight. You, you commented about quiet boats, which is really interesting because one of the, the big challenges that, that whales have yes. um, is collisions with boats. Yes. And it's one of the issues of a, having a super highway, which mm. might also be a big freight highway. So you've been working with United Nations on collisions. Oh, well, one of the things I did was a PhD paper was really important in defining marine roads. So one of the things I did, and I talk about in the book, is work with road ecologists. That's right, people on land who study roads and their impacts. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be a great idea, this is with Professor William Lawrence of uh, James Cook University, wouldn't it be a good idea if we thought about roads on land or as the same as in the ocean. So the impact of a, of a shipping impact, and it's not just shipping that is a challenge to whales. I, will, I don't want to pick on the shipping industry, but if whales are struck by a ship, it happens on the road, marine road. So that's similar to roadkill. See where I'm going here? Acoustic pollution from ships is greatest at the source, so at the ship, but it can go 10 kilometers plus, depending on the conditions, so it expands out. Light pollution on land, so there's all these similarities and parallels. So as a scientist, I'm thinking outside the box, collaborating with other scientists and thinking of great ideas. So if you're here, you're online, you're watching me and you go, oh, I've got something that Vanessa might be able to apply here, or well, that'd be such a great thing, why don't you make that happen? Just talk to a scientist and have that discussion because we defined marine roads for marine giants, which is whales, which are surface active, as well as whale sharks and basking sharks, which might come to the surface to have a bit of sun or feed. And these animals are all vulnerable to ship strike. And yes, whale sharks in Australian waters get struck by ships. In fact, I'll let you in on a little secret. I have a brand new children's book coming out on the 1st of June called Oceans at Night. It's coming out in June. Same publisher, CSIRO, as well. And it actually has a whale shark in there with ship strike on it. So it's actually got a damaged fin. So all these connections I'm trying to relay to the big kids who will read it to the small kids. So you know what I mean? So as a scientist, I'm trying to make all this information accessible. And marine roads, coming back to your question, marine roads has been one of the most instrumental things I've done in my career. I would say that has worldwide implications. And the reference to the United Nations is I was able to present at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations in Rome, looking at an uh, international group meeting are looking at bycatch from marine mammals because unfortunately marine mammals get caught in nets so we don't want that to happen. And there's a, a great documentary out called Collision on that topic. Uh, yes. I, I believe many of the nations now have signed up towards um, making sure that uh, marine traffic is yes. not on whale superhighways. Um, also, yeah, in some areas in America, they have diverted marine roads to avoid right whales at certain times of the year. Now, that is using science to inform how people do things and that's incredible. But also we want to work together. As a scientist, I don't want to be this awful person that's like, oh, let's avoid Vanessa. She's going to make us do this. No. I want to work with you. We want to work with you to help solve a problem together. The talking of wind farms off the East Australian coast, have you heard of that? Mm, yes, mm, it's a big topic, isn't it? So science can really inform our understanding of things and it can help you understand the world around us. So why don't we work together to try and find solutions so that we can potentially reduce our energy output but also make sure whales are safe at the same time. You know, it needs to be balanced. And as a scientist, we need to be accessible and not scary and poor communicators. And we need to be there talking to governments, schools, NGOs, whoever you are, we can talk to you. So I was going to get on to whale, straining, uh, whale stranding yes. is also an outcome, but I think I'm, I might move on to another topic that you just mentioned about communication. Oh, yes. Because one of the, the biggest issues we have about engaging mm -hmm. the general public um, is finding mechanisms to do so. You've developed quite a number through citizen science. Oh, yes. So citizen science is where science is undertaken by non-scientists. So you, you can all be citizen scientists. So often we're at behind our desk or in the lab, not doing fun things, and people are out there saying, oh, Vanessa, we've seen the dolphins in Sydney Harbour. Oh, have you? Because I was not in the field. I was doing all this other stuff. 
Um, and so citizen science is a great way where you can connect with scientists on certain projects. So for example, I've started Wild Sydney Harbour, which is a very local program in Sydney Harbour to learn more about the, the dolphins and fur seals. There is a fur seal that hangs out at the Opera House. His name's Benny, but I like to call him Pavarotti. And there's a few of them. I mean, Pavarotti's kind of fun, right? Um, and so that's a great example. But there are other ex examples of citizen science here in Adelaide. I'm sure you've got uh, yes. great examples. Yeah. yeah, so citizen science is a great way for us as scientists to connect and engage with people who are happy to watch an eagle's nest. I know there are some people like my friend Kathy Cook, who I swim with a whale in this book with, and she was watching these eagles have their babies and like the dedication. How good's that? I'm busy doing science as well, but also looking after two kids. Like we want people like you. You know what I mean? It's so important. So never, ever, ever underestimate the power that you have to work with scientists. Now, some scientists aren't pro a lot of this. I remember writing a paper in my PhD looking at, it's documenting the use of 20 years of citizen science studies and observations by Wayne Reynolds, who was a whale watcher, who'd been watching whales since 1997. Mm. I said, Wayne, look at this data you have. Let's turn it into something. I made him a co-author and now we've got that paper out, which literally documents the recovery of the humpback whale population. I mean, how powerful is that? And th there are lots of really exciting and innovative citizen science projects. So my yes. wife and I, when we were in British Columbia, they had Happy Whale. Yes. Where you took your, your photographs of the tails of the humpback. Yes. And each tail is individual, and you could upload that on a database, and then they oh. could be, you know, that, that would be Freddy or Jenny or, or Happy or Grumpy or whichever the whale is. And it, it added to the database of their movements up and down and their health and all the rest of it. And another good one is Drone Shark App. If you follow them on Instagram, I wrote a paper with Jason who leads that because he's observing all these things. There was in this paper over three years, I believe it was, a hundred and something interactions of people, humans swimming with sharks. And do you know what happened? Nothing. Sharks live in the ocean, everyone. These encounters that we have are incredibly rare if they're negative. And so it's incredibly important to get that out. You can, what, you can follow Drone Shark app every day here in Adelaide as well um, if you want your Sydney fix because you're flying a drone. He's like, oh, there's a sunfish, my favourite fish. They swim around like this. And of course, your, your book mentions and you discuss Wayne Reynolds a lot. And there's yes. quite a lot in the audience who are Wayne Reynolds-like. Yeah. The their knowledge based yes. on personal experience and engagement with butterflies or possums yes. or birds, magpies in particular. More magpies. People with multiple decades of experience with, with birds here. That's an incredible resource. It is. It doesn't, be, be, it doesn't have to expect scientists to yes. do it all. That's a really poor way to approach. Well, when I was trying to publish a certain paper, I had a reviewer who was like, we don't want to let people know that they can keep doing this stuff. I had to really push for that paper. And now citizen science is in. It's a hot thing, right? Everyone wants to be a citizen scientist, and you should be if you can. Just get, get if you're interested in something, why not? Especially if you, you know, kids have gone away now, you don't, you can have a bit of extra time to contribute your time to something. Why not do that? It's a bit of fun. Yeah, and social media is a great way to connect, and we are connected more than ever. And we can use our sightings of certain animals to learn more about certain things, and that's what I definitely do as, on social media as well uh, through Wild Sydney Harbour as an example. And you, so you're a, a big user of social media? Yes. Um, and TikTok and those various... I don't uh, love TikTok, sorry, mm, younger generations. Yeah. But I'm on there. But because I want to be on, accessible. And you've been on Sunrise and yes, yes. Mornings. And, and, uh, and if you can get Carl Stefanovic to understand anything, it's an enormous <laughs> achievement. And Carl is a really awesome interviewer, by the way. And it's so wonderful when I'm approached for interviews because people, the opportunity, as a, I would think about, especially with shark incidences, I know we're talking off topic here, People would shy away from these things, but it's actually really important and it's really wonderful if a channel will come to you and say, Vanessa, we'd love to have you on the show. It's not just about getting on the show. It's actually so much more than that. It's an opportunity to engage with the general public as to, for example, why do whales strand? People want to know why these things happen. And if we can get on the TV and explain that, and I'm not just some, like I have done a PhD in whales, so like I've worked hard, guys. Um, 
it is a really wonderful thing to be able to talk to Carl Stefanovic and have the interview and Sarah Arbo, who I love. Um, you know, these guys, they help, they will work with me to communicate messages, which is so powerful, especially to someone who's not sitting in this room or watching online, who doesn't even give a hoot about the ocean, but they might be in the airport or getting their car serviced and watching TV and going, oh, I just learned something. And that's powerful. I'm a superstar of STEM through Science and Technology Australia's initiative. And one of the greatest things I've learned as a scientist is acting in service to others. And I, I, when I was doing my PhD, people would be like, science communication was not a thing. But if you can provide information to any demographic, it's very powerful. And of course, one place a scientist would never, ever go to deliver the serious messages of marine biology is play school. So ah. you've got to tell us about your experience <laughs> Oh my gosh, so I went from the hosting the Prime Minister's Prizes, which is amazing. Good old Albo, he's great. Um, and uh, the people I met at the Prime Minister Prizes recipients, amazing, these people are amazing. I hope you nominate next year. Um, but yeah, and then going to the Play School experience. So Play School, I watched it as a kid. Yep, I met Daisy the cow. This is the, the ability as a, I don't know, and I don't, can't quite explain it on a personal note. As a kid, if merging nostalgia with something you really love, having the opportunity to connect with a younger generation through something that you've grown up loving, and then knowing that your kids can watch it, it, it is actually one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Like, it's, I, it's, it's literally colorful, but it's also wonderful. And actually, I found out in my year 12 book, they have this most likely to be, and mine was on play school. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to post this online. <laughs> it wow. is actually that. It is. That is. So whoever wrote that, very good. What a, what a journey to be a, a play yeah. school teacher. Wow. I hope to do more. I want to read my book on play school, Oceans at Night, hopefully coming out. But like, you do not understand, I will say this, Every single play school episode, I came in just because I was featuring on it. There is so much resources and knowledge that goes into one single episode. And do you know what the most amazing thing is? It's completely free to each and every one of us in Australia, whether it regards to your socioeconomic background. That is incredibly important. That is incredible. And I, I, I personally am overwhelmed. If in the morning I have a meeting, my one-year-old will sit down and watch play school. I'm not a bad mum. <laughs> but I will put him in front of play school because I know that this is a well-researched program. There's a lot of content, even to how the words are spoken, to how people stand. I was blown away at how much information goes into one single episode. And no, ABC are not paying me because it's a government thing. And I, that's coming from my honest, from the bottom of my, my heart. It's an incredible resource, ABC Kids for Kids and for people who might not have the opportunities that I had to learn. So we are very lucky here in Australia. So we are almost out of time. So I want to wrap up with three questions on the future. Okay. So. Question one, future of the whales. It's looking positive, but challenging. We need to balance recovering whale populations. Some whale populations are not recovering, but many are, which is good news. We now need to manage how do we deal with more whales than we've ever seen before. That's a concern. The science doesn't stop there. So there's 45,000 back. On the, west, on the east coast is over 40,000, so we need to think about our actions there. And in a changing environment as well. So research never stops. Will, will we lose any species? The vaquita is a porpoise right now that is probably going to go extinct in the next few years. There's, I think, nine left in the world. The vaquita porpoise. Who hadn't heard of the vaquita porpoise? Yep, see, hands go up. They're in Mexico, in the water, um, and they are about to go extinct. If we don't take action now, which I know action is taking place in certain ways, it's just a very sad thing. And certain whale populations, like the North Atlantic right whale, they keep getting struck by ships and getting entangled in fishing gear. Our activity is literally limiting their recovery. Yeah. That's ridiculous. And then river dolphins are really struggling around the world. The river dolphins, the Indus river dolphin, I have actually seen a river dolphin in yeah. Bolivia. It was a dream of mine. And my husband went swimming with them and they didn't like him. So they actually were, they were, they were deliberately flicking him water. <laughs> 
And by the way, there were, there were the caiman, the, you know, the alligator animals in there, and, he, and it was muddy. They can't see. Their eyes are tiny, so they use echolocation because they don't need their eyesight. But they were flicking him. It was so funny but scary because at the same time, there were jaguar tracks on the, on the sand. So good luck swimming. And then the jaguar's there. You don't know. <laughs> so with your second future, um, future of young scientists from your position on STEM. Oh, my gosh. Superstar. If there's any... I never saw girls like me growing up. I come from an Italian Maltese family. We used, my parents were insulted at school and they should never have been so. My parents didn't speak Maltese or Italian to me because they were picked on at school. How sad is that? I could have learnt Italian. Oh. So what I'm trying to say is that's obviously terrible. Now, and especially tomorrow, being International Women's Day, what a timely topic, well done, Hawk Centre. Double points there. We, and if I, in my role, I'm doing what I love, right? If I can help inspire the next generation, that's important. But it's not just inspiring the little Georges here. It's telling wherever career path you're at, you have transferable skills and you can do a variety of things and you can collaborate. We as scientists need graphic designers. We need someone to design our drone on the CAD system, in the computer system. I didn't know how to do that. Uh, we, we, we need this collaborative coming together to do amazing things and STEAM and STEM is a colourful thing and we need to be visible for that next generation but we also really need to be visible for other women in science. So I have a mentor, I've also got a mentee and that's the most amazing thing especially as a mum in science, I used to hide the fact that I had children, I honestly did because I wanted to go to Antarctica and I was offered to go to Antarctica and I had to say no because I had told them I had kids. Wow. So now, I mean I love my kids. Right, but now I've not traded them for a trip. No, 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 no. My son will never live it down because I got offered a six-star luxury cruise to go to Antarctica, but I had to say I was pregnant. I had had just had a kid who was two weeks old. She said, "So how how old are your children?" I go, two in two weeks," and she was like, "Oh." Um, so I'm here to say that. And now as a mother, a lot of me and my journey as a mother, I was writing this book pregnant and I, with a small calf running around. And also I remember four days after I'd given birth, I was writing. So I'm writing this book really from the bottom of my heart as a legacy for the next generation. But also I'm proud to say, yes, I'm a mother. Yes, kids are challenging, but also my respect for whale mums is just out of this world now. And if you know, if you actually know a nurse or a midwife, they will really love this book. And also, um, you don't have to be an adult to read this book. If you're around 14 or so, or the t any school teachers or online teachers, we need you. This is a really great book for STEM awareness for young kids as well, and to show that, uh, mindful of time, uh, to show that you can juggle it as well. So I hope you feel inspired because this journey and my own personal journey is one that is appropriate for International Women's Day. And that leads me to my absolute final question with one minute to go. My final future, your future, where next? The world is open to collaboration. So I've got research underway looking at other animals that we need to be aware of in Australian waters. Can't say too much. Uh, I'm always open to working with other people. The world is exciting. We need to create more content for younger minds like George. We need to do amazing things. And I will be working on trying to prevent illegal wildlife trafficking. There are so many things as a scientist I'd love to do and I just can't wait. But I also, I would love to see some parts of the world. I'd love to share with a general audience those experiences and my natural enthusiasm to see these things through educational things. Maybe creating a documentary, that would just be brilliant. Although I cannot, I have to pre-warn the people that I get too excited. Well, we have to get you to Hudson Bay where the polar bears have learnt to leap onto the beluga whale. Oh, wow. See, that's juicy and cool. And I'm not like poor beluga whale. I'm like, yes, I want to see this. This is natural. It's a bit tough on the beluga whale, but it, it's amazing stuff. Thank you very much, Vanessa. It's been an utter joy for an hour and 15 minutes. to, to Thank talk you. To you. Please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you.